Hello and welcome to the next instalment of WGC Explores, a series of videos talking to the IGU's regional coordinators about the issues impacting the gas industry and the impact that the gas industry is having on the world in which we live. Uh, today, I'm joined by Andrea Steger, our regional coordinator for Europe uh, and the incoming vice president of the IGU and Marcel Kramer, for our regional coordinator for Russia, uh, the Caspian and Black Sea regions. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Thank you, Matt. We've obviously seen a very challenging year in 2020 and many of those challenges remain as we head into 2021. What do you take out from uh, the last 12 months and the near-term outlook on, on the importance of the gas industry, the way we... Uh, interact with the rest of the economy and the way the, the communities in which we live rely on our, uh, on our output? Uh, I would say Europe has seen for sure a, a dramatic year, uh, as we all know, uh, but I would say the gas industry has uh, uh, performed uh, very nicely in terms of smooth operations, first of all. So all uh, parts of the value chain were absolutely seamlessly working without any problem to the consumers. That's the first very important point. And second very important point is that uh, while of course the global demand was very uh, much reducing, the gas industry at the end of the day played a good, a good role also in respect of the uh, importance of the coal to gas switch that, uh, uh, that was really in the uh, scenario that we were foreseeing and is happening. So that's for sure one of the main elements we can see there. At the same time, uh, short term combines always with long term. And we all know how Europe is looking at uh, more uh, future green options where the gas industry has to play a role. So it's uh, always a combination of, let's say, mixing elements. So in a nutshell, gas has uh, been very, very robust. Uh, I would say uh, it's playing not just in the power generation, but also in this industrial sector, residential, and indeed is taking up also in the transport sector, which is a very good news. And what do you see as the um, major factors in the year ahead? What are some of the significant developments that we've seen recently and, and, and what's the outlook for their continued evolution? Europe is indeed uh, looking at uh, quite aggressively long-term uh, carbon emission or GHG emission reductions, uh, indeed uh, our industry is uh, called for action into innovation and technology developments that are really expanding our traditional scope. Uh, so in Europe we are talking about renewable gases, hydrogen, of course CCUS, and I would say all of these technology options uh, together with dealing of uh, the issue of methane emissions are really crucial, uh, coming really soon on the agenda uh, as of today, I would say. And we have, of course, to discuss that very carefully and very actively with the institutions. And how do we make the point that uh, whatever your uh, ambitions in terms of decarbonisation, that gas has a, a fundamental role to play in, in achieving those targets? I think we have proven uh, with facts how the industry is innovating, how is it, the industry is combining, uh, let's say, different pieces of the energy space, not just gas. Uh, we have many of our members at IGU uh, expanding their footprint. So I think it's very important uh, in terms of gas industry to, again, uh, create a, a larger boundary, uh, so to speak, in order to capture the ways through which gas can play a very important role going forward. Uh, of course, we have different Europe's. Uh, sometimes we are labeling that as a unique region, but of course you have different facets and you have uh, Southeastern Europe countries or Central Eastern Europe countries, which, has, which have a very different, let's say, environment where coal to gas is the priority. Some other countries which are more, let's say, at the innovation front line, uh, who are maybe more interested into uh, exploring the pilots, which we are all seeing in terms of hydrogen, for instance. Of course, as usual, uh, we have to take care of both the innovation and the, uh, let's say, targets we are looking at and the capability to deliver. 
So for sure, we are experimenting blending. We are experimenting technology to have compressor plants, which are delivering uh, good results also with new uh, molecules. But of course, again, it, it's a long way. Again, uh, we are capable uh, in terms of our industry DNA to look at long-term, but we have to be clear on how we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis policymakers and stakeholders in general, uh, who are maybe more attracted by headlines rather than uh, delivering uh, as, as usual. I think to, to capture one point, we have seen recent issues in other regions of the world with uh, delivery. I would say Europe has made it clear that the gas industry has always performed under any circumstances. And I think that's something that we have to stress again, because again, energy is for consumers, not just for the sake of the energy play in itself. Marcel, how, uh, how are these issues viewed from, from a Russian perspective? The European drive is uh, one which has been uh, noticeable, a drive towards uh, very specific targets and a lot of action, and a fair amount of money going into that drive towards particularly emission reduction CO2. On the Russian side, it is clear that this is an important trend. And what we see is that there is an increasing view in Russia uh, and a government position also, and a company position which uh, recognizes that we have a degree of mutual dependence uh, between in particular Russia and much of Europe uh, when it comes to the uh, cross-border natural gas trade. Uh, and that dependence brings us to an almost automatic conclusion that what, what changes in Europe uh, will uh, one way or the other impact, as it has always done, the Russian market uh, and therefore uh, that interdependence in the natural gas trade automatically leads to the need for a clear dialogue and where possible cooperation when it comes to what we could call the susta sustainability drive and the issues around it. It's encouraging to see that is that increasing uh, awareness, the increasing dialogue. There have been uh, important meetings already held at high level to see uh, how both Russia and, uh, and Europe, uh, and Europe, as Andrea rightly points out, is quite diverse, uh, stand on this issue. Uh, and uh, the opening has been made. I think for uh, work on uh, seeking, increasing, uh, not only understanding, uh, but also cooperation. Of course, when it comes to the practicality of in particular uh, replacing coal by natural gas and thereby really already making a significant contribution to emission reductions, uh, the role of Russia and in fact, uh, also of Black Sea and Caspian countries is, is very important. We cannot do without it. And uh, we have to make sure that uh, the contribution that ha has made to, to uh, the uh, societies and the economies of both Russia and the receiving countries uh, continue to benefit from that cooperation. We've shown it's possible to do that in infrastructure. There is no reason why we cannot do that when it comes to uh, certain aspects of the sustainability drive beyond what already natural gas is delivering. Of course, we saw a marked contraction in Russian uh, gas exports to Europe last year, largely demand driven, partly with a warmer winter 12 months ago, and then uh, the impacts of the pandemic. What's the outlook for re recovery in that, uh, in that export trade? Well, uh, indeed, last year saw a decline uh, roughly when it if you look at particular Gazprom, from the numbers we have so far, it shows a decline of, of approximately uh, eight to 10 percent. Um, and indeed, the factors that you have mentioned did play a role there. Um, that's not an unusual swing. You know, I've, I've had a chance to look back over the past decade and, you know, ups and downs happen. Weather is a major factor. Uh, other things come into play. Uh, and of course, that includes the, uh, the take up of natural gas 
uh, instead of coal uh, and a relative pricing between the two, that's an important factor, weather is a factor, and the pricing between the different forms of LNG, although uh, of, of gas, uh, LNG or pipeline, although I have to say that it is pretty clear that in normal circumstances, normal competitive circumstances for most of Europe, Pipeline gas continues to be a very uh, competitive option. Of course, if Asian demand in particular for LNG is very low, then it seeks a way out of exporting countries and you might find a temporary change in that relationship with a bit more LNG coming. By the way, among that gas that's going uh, into the export markets, of course, LNG gradually plays an increasing role important major uh, Arctic LNG projects, but also other uh, LNG plants that, that do export and find their way around the world, like LNG in a much more much more liquid market is actually doing as we, as we speak. And it's quite impressive to, to witness that change. But pipeline gas is still a major factor and uh, pipeline gas to Europe in particular still dominates that picture. When you look at that for the next few years, I think fair to assume that uh, we should not uh, expect any uh, major change. Uh, if anything, uh, you know, as LNG demand outside Europe also tends to pick up, uh, I would uh, see uh, exports from uh, Russia uh, in both pipeline and LNG form to be pretty robust. I'm talking about the next three to five years. Looking beyond that, things get pretty complicated. Integrating what Marcel was just mentioning, I think the LNG play uh, is coming more, let's say, evident in terms of how Europe, Russia, and the rest of the world are integrating. I would say LNG, uh, as we tend to, uh, to, to level that, is the new oil. So I think that's where I think Europe, the US, Australia, Asia are indeed connecting virtually or commercially where you have a solid uh, market in Europe where you can have a, a, an integrated uh, network, an underground gas storage that is uh, well, uh, let's say, developed and capable of managing fluctuations. So structurally, I'm with Marcel, maybe in a more shorter term view. So uh, you have to face more volatility uh, of flows and of course again uh, being flexible uh, gas can play a very important role in that respect yeah of course we've seen lng now for for 50 years uh, play an increasing role in meeting uh, the world's energy needs particularly in north asia but in recent years expansion both in the number of exporting countries and the number of importing countries what's the uh, how do you expect the balance for for Europe's um, gas needs being met between LNG and pipeline gas in the years ahead? Well, as Marcel was mentioning before, uh, I tend to agree that Russian gas continues to play a fundamental role. Uh, I would say more looking southwards, uh, Algeria is having a, a different pattern where internal consumption is growing quite fast and indeed production is having some difficulties to keep the pace. At the same time, again, building on new infrastructures being put into operation recently, we have uh, new sources coming from uh, the Caspian Sea with the Trans-Asiatic Pipeline and TANAP, of course, connecting Azerbaijan as a new source for Europe. And again, uh, the EastMed findings uh, we have seen recently, Damietta, uh, again, opening the valves for exporting possibly LNG. I'm, I would say, again, taking on the LNG, and storage, I think uh, Europe can be indeed considered a buffer for uh, large LNG portfolio players in the world. So you have, let's say, the possibility to swap cargoes one way or the other and to create the, the real flexibility that the market uh, is needing. You're building on that. Uh, it, it strikes me that the debate uh, between countries and particularly regions or regional institutions uh, and others sometimes uh, becomes a debate about uh, who's first, who's the leader, uh, and there's a little bit of an undertone sometimes of we're the good ones and they're not the good ones. Uh, 
I think that doesn't do justice to the reality of this industry in this world. Uh, what's happening in reality is, of course, that all these examples, or almost all of them, uh, of the cases that also Andrea has been, been mentioning, you know, the fortunate proliferation to, uh, of, of the ability, the growth of the ability to supply natural gas from many different places to many other different places, eh? particularly, but not only because of LNG, also because of new pipeline systems comes about only through international cross-border cooperation. You cannot just send it. There has to be someone who receives this. There has to be someone to sign for it. Not only the, the sale and purchase deal, but the entire infrastructure and handling around it and the standardization and so on and so forth. And to me, that means that when you talk about sustainability, it is absolutely essential that we take the same approach. It has to be a cooperative approach. We cannot. We are not islands. We cannot decide. We can do things ourselves. You know, we have a saying in Dutch, you know, go ahead, improve the world and start with yourself. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, anything that happens in the sphere of energy supply across borders requires partnership and cooperation. And, and I'm actually quite gratified to see that the understanding of that is growing. But every now and then there's an undertone of you know good cop bad cop or maybe good player and not so good player and sure you know countries have different circumstances but let, let's not forget we have to do it together that's the nature of this business of course the the role that gas will play is influenced heavily by the regulatory regimes under which our industry operates whether that be in the producing nations or the or the customer nations uh, we see in the European Union a certain course of, 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 of regulatory reform that is uh, increasing the standards, the environmental standards that we need to meet as an industry. We see regulatory reform in prospect in, in, in Russia. How would you both reflect on uh, the regulatory environment for our industry and how that will evolve in, uh, in the years ahead? Just to focus our discussion today, in, in, in the methane emissions issue because again this is not just European but it's European and affecting the the world outside Europe of course and that's where I think uh, Marcel touched a very good point in terms of our industry being uh, normally inclined and indeed prepared to liaise at a, a extra regional super regional level and to create standards best practices benchmarks that could make it work I think we have to be focusing very much on the fact that we have to uh, create a space for gas in new sectors on one side and uh, again being very active in making gas compatible with the new requirements on in terms of emissions and efficiency indeed. And the regulatory changes perspective in, in Russia will lay uh, impact the role that uh, that nation is playing in, in meeting Europe's uh, energy needs? I think what has become uh, very clear again in, in recent years is that uh, you have to you know, work with the uh, rules and regulations of the market you are serving. That applies to many areas, but it certainly also applies to natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, that principle is fully, even though not always enthusiastically, but by the way, the same goes for players within Europe from time to time, is fully embraced and underwritten by the exporters to Europe, uh, including Russia. Uh, and Russia, of course, uh, has Russian companies have a stake also in part of the uh, infrastructure in Europe itself. Um, think about storage, for example. It's a good example in this case. So. Um, you know, the regulation is what it is. I think in the context of what we talked about earlier, it is critically important that uh, the regulator is involved and, and plays an active role in the dialogue about what is needed to make uh, that gradual transition, because gradual, I think it will be unless we have some major technological breakthroughs in the new, near future, and we cannot count on that. Uh, the, that the regulatory system also uh, encourages, or at least is not an obstacle to the introduction of new technologies and the commercialization of new technologies. 
if I may uh, also complement what Marcel was just saying, I think we have uh, dealt with European gas starting maybe 20 years ago with the uh, separation of infrastructures and commodity players within a stable market in terms of how it was going to be seen in terms of structural, uh, um, let's say, organization. And today to deal with innovation, we we'll possibly have to be a little bit more creative in order, again, uh, to have regulation not blocking, but in, indeed fostering that innovation to take place. Again, we have a long way to go and we have the certainty of not having yet discovered all the solutions. And of course, we cannot afford to leave any option untapped. So that's where I think regulation also will mean uh, flexibility of regulations. As you say, Andrea, um, um, the energy transition will be driven heavily by innovation, by new technology, uh, which in turn requires significant investment, uh, which in turn requires finance. And we're seeing uh, quite some discussion in the international financial community around what parts of the energy offering to support and, uh, and, and how that will evolve. How... how significant do you think the uh, the financing of our industry is the financing of innovation and investment in our industry will be to its to its development uh, in some respect the gas infrastructure industry in, in Europe uh, has been let's say uh, looked at in a traditional way as not needing public support let me put that way on the other side new ways of looking at gas infrastructure, so the blending of hydrogen, the inclusion of renewable gases and things of like are absolutely top of the agenda. Again, what is called on our industry maybe to reconsider or improve for sure is how we are looking at ESG metrics that are uh, coming to be the bread and butter for finance to look at our uh, investment case. Again, uh, Europe, uh, as I said before, can be labelled uh, as a niche market, but it's creating some benchmarks also for other regions of the world. Yeah, quite clearly, the yeah. uh, the financing of the ongoing in investment in our industry is is, is a global issue. Uh, Marcel, any any thoughts to add to that? Well, the situation is is complex and challenging uh, in the sense that I think the gas industry. Um, uh, has to really step up its its genuine efforts to uh, make it clear what our role is and can be uh, when it comes to increased sustainability. That's my first point. And the second point is one where you know I'm I'm concerned when when governments or other institutions or financial institutions, for example, uh, get into a discussion about well you know because of the drive uh, towards reductions, you cannot burn coal. Uh, but by the way, if you thought you were gonna get financial support for burning gas in those countries where this is applicable, which is not everywhere, um, then we also don't wanna do that. Uh, and that poses, uh, creates significant risks to uh, security of supplies. It creates indirectly uh, and, and also directly in some cases, significant costs to the consumer uh, in the nations concerned. And I think this is not recognizing the important role that gas can play as a, uh, a you know, as leading to a reduction of, of emissions. Um, and it also affects our relationship with the producing countries. Let's not forget that. We cannot, we cannot afford or even justify, I think, uh, going to countries with a, a major economic and development challenge and say, well, it's very wonderful that you found a lot of natural gas, but sorry, that's off the books. The opening uh, plenary session at the World Gas Conference uh, in Korea next year is looking at the sustainable future in energy. Uh, wh what do you think some of the groundbreaking projects, uh, technologies or new business models will be that will really drive this uh, energy transition? Hydrogen, of course, is uh, being one of the key elements in, in the European uh, energy transition and long-term strategy. So I think Hydrogen, again, has different colors, uh, rainbows uh, <laughs> colors is very, is very wide. So, but again, 
we will have for sure some important uh, projects with blue hydrogen and CCUS, which is very, very important. At the same time, we will have to prove to uh, bring costs down for green hydrogen as well. Uh, so this is very uh, on one side, on the technology side. On the other side, I would say a different kind of groundbreaking project is the uh, importance of regulation on how to uh, reduce methane emissions and how to measure, report and verify methane emissions uh, with respect, for instance, to LNG cargoes. We have seen some important decisions in terms of FIDs in other parts of the world, but will be affecting for sure our industry at large. Marcel, anything uh, to add to that? Potential issues around larger scale transport through an existing infrastructure, which fortunately the, the gas industry has, has created, although there will have to be some new build as well um, for, for the hydrogen purpose. You know, what does it take in practice to bring it from source to user uh, in that infrastructure across borders and so on and so forth? So that's an area where I think we, we can step up our cooperation and our dialogues and learning from one another, which after all is one of the main purposes of what the IGU is doing. Um, and then, then there's the, the whole uh, storage uh, question uh, with the growing intermittency as solar and, and wind power are, are growing in quite a few countries, what does it take to ensure that 24-7 that energy continues to be available? Gas plays an important role in that. Uh, can we do more to make that uh, an integral part of security of supply for the end user than we are already doing? Uh, to me, those are two important topics. And the third one is actually quite different. It has to do with attracting top talent to our industry. Uh, this is uh, in some countries relatively easy and in many other countries, uh, I think it has been quite a challenge for quite a few years already to ensure that people see our industry as a really attractive place to work in all respects. So what is that? Can we cooperate more in, in, in bringing people in, in training, in development, internationally across borders? Because we are going to need more cross-border cooperation to make all of this work. Of course, uh, another aspect of the human side of our industry is our face-to-face -face interaction, which we have, have had to uh, give up for uh, some time now. But we're hopeful that the World Gas Conference uh, next year in Daegu will be the uh, the first significant, uh, globally significant coming together of our industry in some time. What do you think the uh, the, the 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 move will be like fifteen months from now? Uh, we've obviously spoken through a lot of uh, changes that are, are taking place and changes that are accelerating. Coming from a personal perspective of uh, this very special year uh, or period we are uh, dealing with uh, as of now. I think that there will be an appetite to exchange more, let's say, fluid and horizontal communication. Because again, we are uh, submerged by, let's say, virtual meetings, but they are all, let's say, already planned vertical and having a topic, while the industry has always benefited from uh, very much more fluid, let's say, interaction and communication. Also, because again, it, 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 the, the touch base of the physical, let's say, relationship has made it easier to solve issues many of the times that we have faced that. Of course, we are uh, becoming more uh, inclined to use uh, virtual platforms to deal with our daily life. But I would say the, the physical meeting we will have in Daegu will be a crucial element to start again uh, a new way to combine virtual and physical. So Marcel, what are you looking forward to at, uh, at uh, the World Gas Conference in Daegu next year? Of course, uh, seeing, seeing people uh, face to face, being able to sit down together and talk about not only experience, but particularly about the future uh, is, is really, I think for all of us, a step up from the uh, valuable online contact that we have mastered much more than we probably ever thought a year ago. We've got a long list of things to do, thanks to the work we've done over the past year also. 
uh, with a new setup in the IGU, with modernization ongoing, uh, with new people coming in as well, and, and the experience of what I could call old friends. Um, all of that together will make it a uh, not only a productive and practical and interesting meeting, but also, I think, actually a joyful one. And uh, I'm therefore not surprised that so many of us look forward to it. Well, technology has served us well in, in this meeting, and I thank you both for taking part in it. Um, yeah, but we all look forward to, to meeting face-to-face -face, uh, and in a very significant level uh, doing that in the World Gas Conference in Daegu next year. So thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Matt. And thanks, pleasure. Marcel, thank as well. You. Thank you too, Andrea. See you in Daegu, for sure. So once again, thank you to Andrea and myself for joining us today and taking part in this very interesting discussion on the contribution our industry is making and the impact it is having on the world uh, around us and the communities in which we live. And we'll continue that conversation uh, here at the, at the IGU and through the, the platform of the World Gas Conference in the months ahead. For more information, visit us anytime at our website, wgc2022.org. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon and thank you for joining us today.